apologies for our uh, eventuality to be dumping the new high-tech facility that we have. <laughs> it seems like every time we, we update the new technology, it becomes harder and harder to do yeah. things where we knew how to do perfectly well before. But anyway, it's really my pleasure to offer you today uh, a talk by Melanie Siasmi. Melanie is one of the most ubiquitous figures in ecology and fish biology. She has an incredibly distinguished career of a very long time of doing incredibly cutting edge research and research. She um, comes to us from the American Museum of Natural History, where she has been the curator of fishes since 1987. She got there from Harvard, where she was an assistant curator. And before that, I was 12. <laughs> I thought it was 11. Uh, no, it was 12. She got her PhD at the uh, University of London at the British Museum of Natural History. Then did a brief stint as a postdoc at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And then she came back to the States. And she is incredibly well known by anyone who does fish systematics. But today she's going to talk about something that has sort of evolved from that research of over the last 12 years by working in the lower rapids of the Congo River Basin in Africa, where she has had the opportunity to mix the systematics work with a whole plethora of other uh, approaches to studying fish biology, which is a really an amazingly multidisciplinary research program that I think you're all going to enjoy. So I'm not going to take more time out of Melanie. Thank you. Hernan, thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Excellent. Well, it really is a, a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I was talking with her nan and friend, old friends from Michigan. I, I think it was 30 years ago that I was last here. So, and believe me, there are quite a few changes, which I think many of you are aware of, and all of us standing in this fabulous new building are very aware of. It's great to be back. And it's also great to have a chance to talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing that, that her nan just alluded to. And, I'm going to talk about work that began quite a while ago. Um, in fact, it, my work in the Congo uh, began in 2006. And since that time, most of my efforts have been focused on this very small part of the Congo Basin. Um, so the, so what, the, what I'm actually going to be, this, this very small part is the lower Congo River. And, and for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to refer to that as the LCR. Now, the LCR um, is, although it's a small percentage of the entire basin, in fact, it's less than 2% of, the, of the, the Congo Basin. Our earlier work there showed that in that 2% that area was home to nearly a third of all the fishes found in the entire Congo Basin. And also, we found that more than a third of those fishes were endemic to the LCR. So, in this very short stretch, of little more than 350 kilometers. It's a real hotspot of aquatic biodiversity in the Congo Basin, and in fact, across the continent of Africa. Now, trying to document that diversity and get a handle on why there's so much of it in the LCR formed the initial parts of my studies in, in that region. But before I get onto that, I want very quickly to acknowledge just some of the colleagues and students who have been working alongside me in this project. Now, we've been doing this for a long time, so I'm really just going to talk about the current batch of people there. But as, as you all know, science is a collaborative endeavor, at least good, the best science is a collaborative endeavor. And over the years, many, many people have contributed to this project. And here I'm just quickly going to mention my current team in Congo. Uh, there they are. Just um, point out that this young man, Tobit Lianja, uh, who did his uh, master's work at the University of Kinshasa, has just joined me in New York as a, as a PhD student. So I'm really happy about that. The rest of the current crew, um, from high school interns, undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, postdoctoral fellows, and university colleagues, all of their work has contributed to this pro project. And of course, the, the funders. So today, I'm going to present some of our most more recent studies in the LCR as well as some of the rec research that's currently underway. But to do this, I really need briefly to situate the LCR and to explain our findings um, with regard to its unique bathymetry and complex 
in-stream hydraulics. And that's what I'm going to do first, briefly. Okay, here it is. Here's the, the LCR. Um, it represents the final course of the main stem of the Congo as it flows to the Atlantic. Now, while current understanding of the complex history of the Congo Basin is, is very incomplete, all indications are that the current configuration with an outflow to the Atlantic via the LCR is a very recent phenomenon. The Congo Basin itself has had a protracted history of shifting an intermittent flow to the Atlantic. Sometimes it was a large land, land, landlocked endorheic basin or basins, and at other times it flowed to the Atlantic, but not through this outflow. It, it seems that recent tectonic activity is implicated in the formation of the present-day LCR and with the final capture of the Congo River. And the current high-energy flow regime, which I'm going to be talking about, seems to have been fully established bet sometime between two to five million years ago. So while the Congo Basin itself is a very, very old basin, um, it's been around for a very long time, our study area, the Lower Congo River, is actually a very recent phenomenon. So it's a very young part of the Congo. Now, remember, when the Congo reaches this, this strange structure, Paul Malebo, a swelling, an outswelling pocket in the middle of the Congo River. When the Congo River reaches that point, it's drained some 3.7 million cubic, uh, uh, sorry, million square kilometers of Central Africa. And the average rate of discharge from the pool is over 46,000 cubic meters a second. And that enormous volume of water, more than twice the volume of the Mississippi, flows down a narrow, bedrock-constrained channel on a highly contorted route to the Atlantic. And it does this while dropping some 280 meters in elevation. So the pool is at about 280 meters above sea level. You come down about 350 kilometers to almost sea level. Huge drop in elevation. And the result is a series of things that look like this. And th this is just a very short clip from a video to give you a sense of the enormity of these rapid systems. Trip and Scott crash head first into waves the size of school buses, each weighing about 30 tons. All right. So, sorry. So pretty, pretty, pretty impressive systems. Now, if I show you this map, this is, I know it's a very small scale, this is that, that maps the collecting sites of all our visits along the Lower Congo River. And at this scale, it looks, it looks pretty damn terrific, as if we've really, really done a good job. In fact, we just scraped the surface. Access to the river is extremely limited, and access on the river is treacherous because of all of these rapids that go up and down the, the river. And in fact, our sampling is incomplete, and that's a, a real issue that I'll get to in a minute. Every time we go, we find new taxa, even when we return to places that we've been to before. Habitats here are so complex and so varied that in many ways, fishing here is like looking for, for needles in endless haystacks of rocks, and, then, and most of those haystacks you can't actually get to. But despite these difficulties, and I, I do acknowledge they, they are difficulties, we have been able to use, um, via remotely sensed data, we've been able to map the locations of the main rapid systems. And by main rapid systems, I mean the, 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 the complex cross-channel rapid systems all the way down the Lower Congo. And much of our work has been aimed at investigating the impact of these series of longitudinally arrayed high-energy rapid systems on the diversification patterns and population structuring within species in this system. And in an early study um, undertaken in, in this region that's highlighted there in yellow, so in, a, in an early study, we looked at divergence among a number of populations of two narrowly endemic species. Now, this study was based on a single mitochondrial marker and a bunch of microsatellites. But even so, 
we were able to see patterns of phylopatry and picked up clear signals of longitudinal structuring of populations apparently associated with the locations of major rapids. And we saw this at, at quite fine geographical scales. The entire study area here, from site A to site E, um, is less than 50 kilometers. Yet we saw a very stark picture of longitudinal structuring. Um, but these are blunt tools. And with the advent of high throughput sequencing technologies, it's been possible, as you all know, <laughs> within the last uh, seven or so years, it's become feasible to generate massive amounts of genetic data, allowing us to in investigate in much finer detail um, the population dynamics and potential speciation scenarios for taxa in this extreme system. Basically, to get at the questions of what is driving population divergence and why are there so many species there. And at this point, I do want to quickly acknowledge my primary collaborator, Liz Alter. Now, Liz has been instrumental in dragging me into the modern uh, molecular age. She's been a great uh, partner in this ent enterprise. And perhaps a bit ironically, um, it's been Liz's molecular evolutionary expertise that's really reaffir reaffirmed for me the importance of rigorous morphological work. It's kind of reinvigorated that for me. Because this, it's the rigorous morphological work that can so illuminate and give substance to the many genomic studies that these new technologies are now facilitating. And in the latter part of this talk, I'll, I'll briefly introduce some of that morphological work. OK, very, very quickly then, here's a, some first results of a, one of our early forays into, uh, in this case, using DDRAD-seq to look at a, a clade of rapids adaptive um, cichlid fishes in the genus Telegramma. I'm not going to go into any details, but I want to point out that we, we sampled populations in, at Le Rapide, which is on the uh, right bank of the Congo as it comes out of Pumalebo. This is actually in the Republic of Congo. And then opposite that, distance separated by a little over a kilometer, uh, populations at Kinsuka, which is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then a few sites up and down, downstream from that. And it's, it's very clear that um, this genome-wide uh, data is indicating a major cross-channel barrier, barrier operating to separate those populations, separated by less, just a little over a kilometer on either side of the Congo River. I, I often make the analogy, it's like, <clears throat> it's like people living in Manhattan aren't interbreeding with people living in Hoboken, the opposite side of the Hudson River in New Jersey. So New Yorkers don't interbreed with New Jerseyites. And, well, I mean, may maybe that's actually true, Pro possibly a different mechanism operating. But it's a remarkable small scale for such a high level of, um, of differentiation between populations. OK, before getting on to our most recent and what I think is our most exciting work, I do need to add one more piece of background information. And this was something that completely changed our view of the Lower Congo River. And it all hinged on this, the discovery of this, this fish. Now, it's a cichlid. It's blind. It's completely depigmented. De de it's very weird in many respects, and I'm going to be talking about some of that. But what's perhaps most weird about this cichlid is that we only ever find it dead or dying at the water surface. Found them, quite a number of them, but always dead and dying. And on one expedition, we went back to the site, always in the same region, we went back to the site, and local fishermen brought us one of these fish that was still just alive. I mean, it was obviously kind of moribund, and it was close to dying, but it was alive. And as I held it in my hand, it died. And as it dies, its body filled with air bubbles. So it was, it was, it was, it was decompressing, and all over its gills and all along the back around its fins was air bubbles. It looked as if it was suffering from catastrophic decompression syndrome. I mean, the fish's uh, equivalent of the bends. Now, up until then, all our work had concentrated on rapids, and rapids are very shallow water phenomena. But yet here we were coming across a fish that seemed to be dying of the bends. So for the first time, we asked, could there, could there be deep water here? Now, it's a, it's, a, it's a long story as to how we actually um, got to uh, resolve that question, but we did fin finally resolve it. And very briefly, 
with colleagues from the um, USGS, we were able to deploy these, this, this piece of equipment called an acoustic Doppler current profiler, the ADCP. And these measure velocity profiles and backscatter through the water column. And you can synchronize that in real time with, with data from an echo sounder and uh, differential GPS. And you can gather all of this data about what, about not just the depth that the um, ADC trees, ADCP is traveling over, but also what, what, what are the water conditions? Oops. Okay, so let me move on to the next one. All right, so this is a little bit, um, a little bit difficult perhaps to follow, but just, just um, to run you through it. This is some, a visualization of some of that ADCP data. And um, this is taken from a transect here at what we're calling bend two. And now imagine you're standing in the, the, the river bed and you're looking upstream. And the color code, this is, this is showing vertical, the colors represent vertical velocities. So the, the warm colors, the reds, and the, the greens and the, and the yellows and the reds are going up, and the blues are coming straight down. First, let me point out, this is the depth. We're over 150 meters deep at that point, close, close in fact, to 160 meters deep. And that's the deepest point that we know of in any river that's ever been recorded. So when you add that tremendous depth and you look at this extraordinary um, turbulent flow of water literally plunging down hundreds of feet and coming straight up at speed at hundreds of feet, if this is where that, that blind fish is living, deep, deep in one of these can canyons, you can clearly see that if it gets somehow entrained in one of these jets of water, it could be pushed up to the surface, decompress, and be found dead or dying at the water's surface. So we think that this is, A, kind of cool that the, water, that the lower Congo is so deep, but B, the, the turbulence of the flow is, is quite staggering. So look just at one other place. This place is, is not quite so deep. We're now looking at, at Bend 1. Um, we're still at about 90, 90 meters depth. I mean, the, one of the deepest places in the Amazon is about 100 meters in depth, so we're still pretty deep. But in this case, I want you to look at the colors which are now representing streamwise velocities. So you're standing in the river channel, you're in a cross section through the river channel. The reds and the yellows are water flowing straight towards you. And the greens and the blues are water flowing in the opposite direction. So you've actually got rivers within rivers. And you can imagine, if, if you're a little fish, you're living, you're living on the rocks here, you make him swim out here a bit, you're going to get caught and trained in this, and you're going to get plunged straight down to the Atlantic Ocean. It's almost as if you've got an inverted mountain of, of water, uh, sorry, an, yeah, an, an inverted mountain in the middle of that, that channel. Hugely complex and really giving you a good insight into what might be driving this microalopatric speciation or population divergence. We always think, you know, if you're a fish and there's water, that's what you need, it's the dry land that's a, that's a barrier. In this system, it really looks at the, like the water itself is causing, um, is, is inhibiting population um, passage, both upstream, downstream, and from one side of the river to the other. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> it's clearly, the LCR is clearly a highly unusual riverine, riverine um, system. It's rocky shorelines, this in incredible bathymetry with huge towering columns of rocks, very deep channels in places. Here just shows, I'm sorry, it's such a busy figure, but here we just show these crazy, we, this is a crazy kayaker. We, one, one thing, we wanted to, to get a, a, a trace of, of, of what the river looked, looked like in river depth down here. So what we did was we, um, we recruited the pleiotropic effects of a Y chromosome on some, <laughs> on some uh, young, young men, and they were willing, the, they, they were willing to put in at Kinsuka and go all the way down. This is the depth trace. Actually, the hardest thing was not to get them to, to, to make this run. The hardest thing was to allow us to drill a hole in the bottom of their kayak so we could put an echo sounder in there. They were very upset about that. But anyway, this trace, I get, and again, it's very small scale, but just to give you a sense that where we, ha where we took this data, 
in, in a, is nowhere near the deepest part of the lower Congo. Here you can see we're getting down to close to 220, 230 meters deep in places. And the, thing that's so ex oops, and the thing that's so extraordinary about a lot of that is that you have really shallow rapids right adjacent to really deep holes. So uh, in, uh, literally, you know, I could take a measurement here and we'd be at like eight meters. And I could walk over to you and we'd be at 100 meters. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, just a remarkable, crazy, crazy system. Okay. Um, so it's a really cool system, and that's the reason I'm still there. And, we're, we, and as I say, we're constantly turning up new things. I've already alluded to the fact that on um, each trip we find new taxa. But most of these are pretty normal. They're normal in the sense that while they're clearly diagnosably distinct from other species we've collected in this region, they tend to be typical members of the fish families to which they belong. But not all of them are, and, th and those are the ones I'm going to be talking about now. Uh, fishes like this, you've seen this one, Lamprologus lethops, the weird cryptophthalmic uh, form, and now you can um, give a, 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 a sigh of shock when I show you there are a whole suite of other fishes that, um, have, or that are all cryptophthalmic. So they've lost or greatly reduced the, the, the size and the image-forming capabilities of their eyes. All are depigmented, de 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 and despite very different shapes and sizes of their bodies, they've all converged on what seems to be a very, superficially at least, striking, strikingly similar phenotypes. And we're calling this crypt a cryptophthalmic syndrome. And they've done this, this is, these are, this is across a suite of families in the LCR. And this phenomenon of convergence, when, when evolution independently produces derived yet remarkably similar traits, provides a, a powerful natural system to study adaptive evolution. Now, a growing number of such studies exist, but nearly all of those have been limited to investigations of convergence in populations within species or between closely related species. And most have involved a, a small number of traits. Now, in contrast, um, this LCR system of in situ convergence spans a remarkably deep phylogenetic spectrum. In fact, it spans the teleostean tree of life, making this an outstanding and perhaps unique model to investigate, to investigate the phenotypic and genotypic underpinnings of responses to this highly selective regime and to do this over macroevolutionary timescales. So for some of these um, uh, LCR cryptophthalmic forms, we already have a phylogenetic framework. For example, the spiny eels, the mass assembled spiny eels. Put these in a phylogeny, an Africa-wide phylogeny, phylogeny of, um, of mastus embellids. And interestingly, the two cryptophthalmic spiny eels endemic to the lower Congo are not closely related to each other. So cryptophthalmia has arisen twice within the mastus assembled eels in the lower Congo River. So, so they, those two, those two little couplets, make a very nice comparative pair to look at. They've both done it independently. It's happened twice. Um, but for the others, we're really, really less sure about their phylogenetic relationships at the moment. And I've shown them up here as little couplets, species pairs, um, looking at uh, examples of their LCR, so other endemics from the LCR, but that are not cryptophthalmic. And this is useful for, for broad comparative purposes. But clearly, we do need to derive a phylogenetic framework for each of these crypto cryptophthalmic forms. And so that's um, the, next, uh, the next stage of, of, of what, what we're in the process of doing. And one of the most prom promising methods, we think, for reasonably cost-effective phylogenetic analysis across such large phylogenetic um, distances uh, is through targeted enrichment of ultra-conserved nuclear DNA, U UCEs, you know, in fact. And with this, with this technique, 
and maybe we're being a bit cheapskate here, but with the same set of probes, we can do these studies, whether we're talking about mastocembalid eels, cichlids, um, macoquid catfishes, chloreid catfishes. We can basically just need to buy one probe set. And as a, as a proof of concept for the use of UCEs in our system, we s decided to try this first with um, the Lamprologans, with some cichlids, Lamprologan cichlids. So the one that um, the blind cichlid lethops is a Lamprologus. And cichlid relationships have proven notoriously difficult to resolve. And as far as I know, this is the first um, preliminary study that's been tried using, using UCEs. And I don't want to you know, amuse you with trees and all the rest of it. The bottom line is, it does look very promising. I mean, some of these nodes could be better supported, but nonetheless, it looks like that at multiple levels, using UCEs on this system is, is going to be pretty good. And we're planning similar studies for each of those families that have thrown up cryptophthalmic forms in the lower Congo. Okay, so now I'm going to turn quickly to morphology and morphological analysis. Um, we really need these, the, this, this morphological characterization and to quantify convergence between species pairs and across lineages. And therefore, we're going to be able to provide the morphological data we need for all of the downstream comparative evolutionary modeling that we want to do. So to do this, I chose CT scanning. And now everyone's very familiar with CT scanning, so I won't go, to go, on, go into it in much detail. But other than to say, I chose this for, for two reasons. The first reason was it is entirely pragmatic. It's because for some of these fishes, some of these cryptophthalmic fishes, they're extremely rare, and we have very few specimens. We know virtually nothing about their, their habitats, their lifestyles, anything, and we just have a few individuals. So for those, in those circumstances, CT scanning, which is non-destructive, um, is, is obviously ideal. It's, a, it's an excellent option for us now. But secondly, because we're comparing cryptophthalmic morphologies across such, such wide morphological, uh, sorry, phylogenetic distances, in some ways what we're trying to do is, is like comparing rhinos with wombats. They're so morphologically different because they're so morphologically, um, you yeah, know, they're just wombats and, and rhinos. Their relationships are very, very distant. But with the use of CT, and the processing software that are now available, we can begin to quantify some of these morphological traits across these huge um, phylogenetic distances. So I entered the, the world of CT scanning, and you know, here's it. For hard tissues, it's, it's pretty trivial. You just need to know a little bit of anatomy, and you can, you can produce some really, really nice morphological data. This is from a specimen that we collected last, uh, last year, a very strange Lamprologus, only one individual. So we were really able to look at its anatomy in good detail. Another thing that's nice about this is that you can do virtual dissections. And I can now look at the otoliths in situ and make um, really interesting comparisons. Um, but to really get at what I thought was, was um, probably going to be more fruitful and more interesting, I need to look at not just at the bones and calcified structures, but also to look at soft tissues, musculature, nervous, sensory systems. These are where we think the, the action is really going on with these cryptophthalmic forms. And to do this, we've used this um, contrast-enhanced staining. Now, once you do that, you get a much more, you get a very, very data-rich um, picture, but it's much more complicated to actually segment out stuff. And believe me, it's a lot, it, it is a lot harder and it can take a long time. So here, I'm just showing you single 2, 2D sagittal slices through the heads of some of these on the left, the crypto, uh, sorry, on the right, the cryptophthalmic form, and then its little species pair couplet on the other side. And if you look at these three, uh, these, yeah, so if you look at these, I think you can immediately see, if we're going to try and compare, say, a cichlid with uh, a, a stomatorhinus, a more myrid, or with a mastocembalid, you, you see the kind of rhino wombat problem. The comparison, it's, there's virtually nothing other than you can say it's an eye and it's a muscle. There's not really anything you can do. But by using these, these paired couplets, I think you can begin, we can begin to pull out things um, that even though the anatomy is very different, 
uh, certain similarities are evident. And here I've highlighted just a couple of these, where the cryptophthalmic uh, form appears to have an ad enhanced addu adductor musculature compared to its sighted uh, congener. It obviously has the much, the much, re the much reduced um, or orb, lens, and uh, retina. And it also seems to be that the cryptophthalmic forms are somewhat more heavily ossified in, neuro in the neurocranium. So by doing this kind of couplet pairing comparisons, I think you can begin to pull out some of these features. And this is very preliminary, obviously, but these are exactly the, the kind of features that we're looking for that are shared across these large phylogenetic distances. Um, this is very preliminary, but these are th these are the kind of things we're, we're looking for. So now, if we turn to uh, 3D reconstructions, here's a cranial vault, and the otoliths. Uh, this is of Lamprologus lithops, and the otoliths uh, are slipped in there. Now we can add the brain and some of the sensory structures that are associated with this, and we can do this with um, other cups. So here's our couplet with um, lithops at the top, and it's uh, a sighted congener below. Uh, we can do this with the mast assemblids, again, the cryptophthalmic form, and the sighted sister group below. And we can do it also, in this case, with the, with the chloreids. And in this way, although the morphologies, the individual morphologies are very, very different, we can begin to, begin to see these fe features in common. For example, perhaps uh, counterintuitively, it seems that the olfactory rosettes, I mean, how does a fish smell? Terrible. No, fish smells with an olfactory rosette, right? The olfactory rosettes in the cryptophthalmic forms, and these are the primary site of olfaction in fishes, have a reduced number of lamellae and are variously structurally disorgan disorganized. Now, why, this, this is very bizarre, but why would you see this? Why, if you can't see, do you end up having a terrible sense of smell? Perhaps, much more understandably, we see a similar kind of across the board pattern where the cryptophthalmic, in the cryptophthalmic forms, the ear bones, the otoliths, have become larger and are more densely calcified than those of their eyed congeners. And otoliths obviously play an important function in balance and orientation, positional information, and secondarily hearing. So that makes much more sense that if, you, if you're blind, you, 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 can, you can hear and orient better. So slowly, we can begin to characterize the morphological features in this LCR cryptophthalmic syndrome. And we've really only just begun to do this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done, but through these comparisons across species pairs and over phylogenetic distances, I hope you, would, you will agree that these early results are promising. I mean, they raise lots of questions, but it's, it's, we're, there's something here. And so we're going to get continuing this part of the study also. And now I'm going to turn very, very briefly to the next bit, which is the, the, the genomics side of this question. We're on the home stretch, I promise, but I, I do quickly want to outline some of the geno genomic components of the study. And here I must acknowledge again my colleague Liz Alter, and in this case also Matthew Ardemer, both of my colleagues in New York, who are very much taking the lead on this part of the study. So the question really becomes, I mean, can we get at the genetic underpinnings of this extraordinary series of convergent morphological traits across such phylogenetically divergent taxa? And we certainly hope so, because that's what precisely what, what makes this LCR system so unique and so powerful. Well, for the, for the fish families that, have, that exhibit cryptophthalmia in the lower Congo, Without doubt, the best genomic resources are currently available for cichlids. And a good number of cichlid genomes um, currently exist. And luckily for us, one of those is from the genome of Neolamprologus brachade, uh, a, a Tanganyikan relative of our lower, Congo, um, our lower Congo radiation, and of course, including uh, lithops. So, um, on the strength of this, Liz and I decided that we, we should start getting a genome sequenced for lithops and 
a, a congener, in this, in this case Tigropictylus, which is a sighted form which um, overlaps in its range with, with lithops. And we, d we did this. We did this with a lot of short reads, but it, we, we did it successfully. Getting, getting genomic data is pretty trivial, it's like, as long as you've got some money. Trying to interpret it and make sense of it is not trivial. And I, and I totally have to say I, I, I'm grateful to Matthew and, and Liz for, for the work they're doing with that. The, the bioinformatics are, are really, really very complicated. But very, very broadly, this is the comparative approach that we're taking. Uh, and we're fortunate that in addition to a good number of, of cichlid genomes, we have a couple of very helpful additions. Uh, on the right is the Mexican uh, blind cavefish, Astianex Mexica mexicanus. Now, many, many cavefishes have uh, evolved a distinct set of morpho morphological features, sometimes called the troglomorphic syndrome, which are generally considered to be adaptations to selective regimes of, uh, of a lightless or low light, low energy environment in caves. And many of these features do appear to be very similar to those of the LCR cryptophthalmic forms or cryptophthalmic syndrome that, that we're documenting. Most obviously, the loss or the reduction of the eye and the loss of pigment. Now, happily, a lot of known, there's lots known about these features in Astyanax, and this cavefish has, in fact, emerged as a model organism for studying the processes that result in what's sometimes called degenerative or regressive evolution associated with this troglomorphic um, lifestyle. And additionally, we have, of course, um, resources from the fish on the left, um, the encyclopedic studies of the zebrafish, Danny O'Rerio, where, for example, a whole suite of ocular disorders have been documented and investigated. So we've got, a, we've got some very nice comparative bases now. We've got cichlids that are completely non-cryptophthalmic. We've got cryptophthalmic cichlids. We've got cryptophthalmic astyanax, we've got you know, eye and body and pigmentation disorders in, in Danio. So by taking this deeply kind of comparative approach and comparing genotypic evolution across these large divergence times, um, we hope that we're going to be able to gain some insight into how, at the genomic level, that the, the changes at the geno genomic level that have resulted in the independent evolution of such remarkably similar phenotypes. Now, I haven't got time to um, go into specifics or the pipeline that Liz and Matthew have developed or the, the quality control mechanisms and the filtering, uh, all of the work that goes into this genomic work. But I do want very quickly to hone in on, on two, um, a couple of interesting preliminary findings, and I like these because they highlight another interesting aspect of working with genomes on rare species that we generally know very little about ecologically or physiologically. In a case like lithops, we find ourselves making a lot of guesses about its habitat, its ecology, and its lifestyle. So having a genotype can be an extraordinarily rich um, source of information about its way of life, its basic biology. And it's, it gives us a, 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 a possibility to investigate that, this in a way that we, we couldn't do otherwise. For example, um, based, based on its um, appearance and how we only find it dead or dying at the surface, um, we hypothesize that lithops lives in deep, deep canyons in lightless environments. But we've no proof of this. I mean, that's just, that's just our guess. And when we began looking at candidate genes or genes that showed st strong signal of selection, we weren't looking for um, UV damage repair genes at all. But, what's, but, but these genes did emerge as an interest, interesting category related to the phenotype. Um, they certainly have, uh, emerged as a whole suite of variants of strong effect. When we looked closer, we found that genes such as this DDB2 DNA damage binding protein 2 that seems to be essential for repairing the incessant damage uh, that comes from UV light, as well as all of these other um, UV-related genes that have got loss of function in lithops compared to the, the non-cryptophthalmic forms. It really looks like 
which isn't to say that there might not be other damage UV light repair DNA repair genes operating in lethops, but it's 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 very suggestive, and we consider this to be it's quite strong support derived from the genome to support our hypothesis that they are living very deep, and they very rarely come in contact to light. They're rarely exposed to UV light, because if if they were, they they have some very serious problems. And the homo homologs of this gene in humans. Uh, mutations in this gene in humans produces the most disgusting. Um, don't don't look it up on Google. It's the pictures are horrendous of what the damage to that gene does in humans, um, and most people die, um, never make it to adulthood with it. And a, a, G, a muta mutation in another gene that's lost a fun lost its function in um, in lethops has been shown to again be linked to extreme light sensitivity. So. It's kind of interesting that you can look at the genome and pull out of the genome some support or some information about where this animal might actually, actually be living. And that was a kind of nice, nice thing that we discovered. And, and here's another one. Um, likewise, Lethops um, shares other distinctive traits now in comparison with the Astyanax, the cave-dwelling Astyanax. Um, despite the fact that their habitats are so different, I mean, the, the what I've shown you about that high energy system in the lower Congo couldn't be more distant, <laughs> different than the low energy system in a, in a cave, in a Mexican cave. Um, however, we don't know anything about food availability down there. Um, it is known that cave fishes, compared to their surface dwelling forms, are extremely fat. They tend to be remarkably fat. They're starvation resistant. So every once a year or so, food gets swept in to, the, uh, to their cave when it floods, and they binge eat. Now, we have no idea if lethops is li what, what the food resource for lethops is. But what we've found is that they do show um, loss of function in this spexin. And in spexin loss, it results in a loss of satiety, so appetite suppression. They basically eat like pigs. Uh, we know in goldfish it in also increases uh, food intake and binge eating, and binge eating in the zebrafish. In humans, it's re down related in obese humans and rats, and if you inject spix into yourself, I mean, maybe I need to do that instead of stopping carbs. Uh, it, it reduces food intake and increases your locomotion. So, um, in this case, we looked at it with these scans, and indeed, it's actually it's really quite lovely to see. Here's lethops, here's its congener, sighted congener, and all of these are fat glob globules. So, it really, it really is stuffing away food and storing it as fat. And here it is in the, in the, site, in the cave Astyena, you can get, again, you see these, these fat globules not present in the surface form. In this case, we've got phenotypic sim similarity, but it looks like the um, genomic underpinning of this, this, this fat, fatness is different in the, in the uh, cavefish, in, in the Astyanex than it is in lethops. Anyway, okay, so there we are. Um, oh, I, think I've, I think I'm probably running out of time, but one, one of the big, big, bigger questions about all of this is this notion of, is there such a thing as regressive or degenerative evolution? Is, is that really possible? You know, is it really neutral, or, or could it be adaptive? Could it be being strongly selected for? And I'm not going to go into details, but it, it, it looks from, from this sliding win window analysis that we did, looking at, oh, sh looking at these, um, these, on this particular scaffold, we, uh, there were three of our genes of interest, um, first off, um, heterozygosity across the board in, the, in these guys is much lower than in its, its sighted congener. Not surprising, probably much lower effective population size of these compared to these guys. But here we have virtually no heterozygosity. They're all in troughs. Each of these genes are situated in troughs. Up here, there's, there's no indication of strong selection for them. So it looks as if a lot of these features are actually 
been strongly selected for, and we get evidence of, of, of selected sleep for them, it's very unlikely that there is such a thing as regressive evolution. And with that, I leave you. You're probably as exhausted as I am when I come back from, from the Congo. Um, I thank you for your attention. I thank the Congolese people who've uh, enabled this, this project to keep going for all these years. And of course, all of the thousands of fishers that gave their lives so that um, I could be here to give this talk. So thank you. I don't know how I've done for time, but pretty good. Pretty good for time. Thank you. Thank you. So please Any questions? And, uh, ask away. Oh, come on. Bill. So how do you sample in these really horrible I know. Water I know. Turbulent. It's terrible. I, I, I mean, I think our sampling has just scraped the surface. We, we clearly can't sample in those really, really turbid, crazy systems. But what we tend to do is we use rotenone. known. Uh, which is a, 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 a natural uh, fish toxin. It's organic. That it's organic. It's an organic uh, that um, disperses very rapidly and breaks down in uh, UV light. But we'll put the rote known in. We'll, we'll see the way the currents are going over a rapid. We'll put the rote known in one side of the rapid and just be down at the other end and catch what we can. You know. So it, it really is the case that uh, I, I think we just touched the, the surface of this. And um, yeah, and, and we have so few I mean, of lethops because they are f apparently coming up quite, quite often, which is kind of weird. It's a little bit like finding um, uh, mountain goats dead on the bottom of mountains. I mean, it just seems to be rather maladaptive. But um, we, we've got now we've got about 30 or 40 lethops bodies. But for some of these other cryptophthalmic forms, we have no idea where they're really living. And we have one or two individuals. Yeah. So these things that are coming up, is there any seasonality to how uh, they seem to state? Are they, do they have big ovaries? <sighs> they, I, I thought you were going to ask about guts because as they come up, you know, everything gets squirted out because the swim bladder is, is, is you know, pushing everything out. Whether it's pushing the gonads out, I don't know, but I have not found. I mean, you can sex a cichlid by looking at its... Um, genital papilla, so I know what their sexes are, but I haven't actually come across eggs or, or sperm or, or testes in, in any of them. Um, so no, I, d I don't know the answer to that, but they seem to be coming up all year round. Yes, so sir. The, uh, the upper Congo area where it's much flatter, that's, that's very seasonal, right? Where you get snow? No, it isn't really. The Congo is, very, is a very interesting different kind of river because it, it's, it forms this great arc through the center of Africa, and it crosses the equator twice. So all of the, the northern tributaries, when the northern tributaries are in flood, the southern tributaries are dry, oh. and vice versa. So you don't, it's not like the Amazon where you get these huge pulses and the flood plains and the fissures in the forest and stuff like that. No, the Congo for nearly all of its time is constrained into a channel. Now it's not constrained into a tiny channel like the lower Congo. I mean, in places, the, the Congo so is 15. Hmm? It's all, it's yeah, yeah. This, this is, all of, that, all of that documentation, that video and everything is in the height of the dry season. <laughs> the height of the dry season. So it, it's an, it's an truly intensely insane system. But I, I'll just say one other thing, seeing as there aren't questions. I'll say one other thing. Um, it's only lethops that we know of that's really that we think is living really deep. The other the other cryptophthalmic forms we, we we find them alive. They're not then you know you don't just find them dead. You, you they're, they're rare and you have to really keep looking for them. But they they don't seem to be living at depth. They're 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 probably you know when you when you look at some of those slides and you see all those rocks and everything where you imagine that just keeps going down <coughs> underwater. They're probably living. Un, you know, in cave-like structures mm -hmm. underwater, mm -hmm. but not actual caves. Yeah. Okay, I just have two questions for you. Do you, do you get any pigmented fishes that, that uh, have bends when they come up? Is, is this the only one that? that well, you know, in, in the fish world, yeah, in the fish world. Now, you, in your samples, no. You, see any, you don't see anything else that's degassing. Don't. There's no other fish that we know of that's only found dead. I mean, yeah, okay. 
Yeah. And then the second question is, uh, I don't know about cave tissue, but cave invertebrates have really slow growth rate relative mm -hmm. to the other thing you see. Have you tried to estimate growth rates of these guys? Uh, I don't know how I would. I don't know how I would begin to do that. I mean, I, I'm dealing with dead dead bodies. That some of those dead bodies have been dead, dead quite a quite a long time. They're big. Isotopic. Uh, daily rings. Daily rings. Um, tropical fish don't tend to. You know, it's not it's it's not so easy. You can't do it in the tropics. So my 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 feeling is that they're probably very slow, yeah. slow growing. Although they do get big for, you know, we've had some individuals that are this big, you know, and with, they're within this clade of Lamprologus. Most Lamprologus, certainly all the, the, the lower Congo Lamprologus are, are small fish. So they definitely do get quite big. But probably, my suspicion is very slow growing. Yeah, I took that slide out. Oh, terrible, yeah. So um, in that, I don't know if you remember that, that very first slide I showed where we did that first study and there was a yellow box around a, an intense series of, of, of rapids. That's the Inga run. And there have been plans on, there are two small dams on uh, where they've diverted some of the, the lower Congo to two dams in, in the Inga region. And there have been plans on the books since probably the 50s to do a grand Inga. And it keeps, because of the political situation, the lack of stability, the amount of money it would cost. Um, there have been plans on the books. It, the, the, it's going to happen, then it doesn't happen. It's going to happen, it do, doesn't happen. Um, the World Bank was going to uh, underwrite it. Then they, they, they withdrew. And the latest thing is the, the Spanish and the Chinese have stepped in, and they are proposing to dam the Lower Congo at Inga. And the, the, their, their estimates of output is more than three times the output of the Three Gorges Dam. So yes, that is an incredible, incredible um, carrot there. Whether it will actually happen, I, I you know, I don't, I don't know. I guess maybe it's, it's, it's too tempting not to. But just the logistics of it, it's not just building the dam, which would be hugely. Um, expensive and difficult, but it's also laying all those transmission lines because they want to send it to South Africa, they want to send it to Southern Europe. I mean, it depends on which, and believe me, I'm not privy to, to, to all of their plans, they're pretty secret. But um, th there is a, a, a valley that they're thinking of diverting it off into. So um, I, d I don't know that it depends. It really depends on whether they do a stage thing, where they where they do what they call Inga three, and then they're going to do Grand Inga. I, I I don't know, but it ain't going to be good. Are we good? Thank you very much. Okay, Mama. my pleasure. Thank you.